Anyone here ever tried to watch cricket? The game, right? The, the game that's one of the most popular games around the world that we don't play here at all, right? Every once in a while, I, I hear cricket scores, or I hear about cricket because I listen to news from around the world, and I'll, I'll hear about uh, they go bowling and batting in the same game, and something about a wicket, which may or may not be sticky, and uh, they are playing uh, a test match at, at the... Test match at the Ashes, which lasts five days, and they end up scores with like 180 for four against 109 for 10, and so one team wins by 71. And I listened to all this, and I think, I have no clue what they just said. I know, I know it was English, but I, I don't, I don't understand. Right? But to try to understand cricket, what, what would it take? You'd have to have someone explain it. You'd have to have someone sit down and take some time and explain because it's not part of our culture. It's not part of how we think. It's not what we're used to thinking about. It's just completely foreign to us. And I think of cricket when I, I'm reading the book of Leviticus because it's about as confusing at times. Right? It has its own language. It has its own lingo. And if you don't understand what the words mean, you're just going to be lost. Right? It's just going to be utterly confusing. Well, I cannot explain cricket to you, and uh, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to try. I, uh, I can't explain a bit about Leviticus. I can't explain the terminology, the lingo. And uh, once you know the lingo of ter Leviticus, it, it makes the whole book make a lot more sense. And so you have in front of you a handout. On one side is the... Uh, this is the outline of the book of Leviticus. You want to hold on to that and put it in your Bible. Um, we're not going to do anything with it today, but that's to help you understand how it all fits together. We're going to be looking at this side with the, the graph, the, the chart here. And this is what you need to understand to be able to, be able to read Leviticus. Leviticus is, is predicated around three terms, moving between three terms. Holy, clean, and unclean. If you understand those three terms, you're going to do well. So we're going to take a moment to figure out what they, they, what they get at. We'll start with clean. When I say clean, what do you think of? If I describe a counter as clean, what is it? No dirt. Right? No dirt. Clean. Uh, clean. It's been scrubbed. It's been sanitized. It's clean. You can lick it and have a problem. That's, that's clean, right? That's not what Leviticus says when it says clean. When Leviticus says clean, it can be talking about a cow in the field covered with mud. It's clean, because clean means normal. And whenever it says clean in Leviticus, think normal. It's, what, it's the common normal thing. And so a normal, normal healthy livestock, when Leviticus is describing it, is like a cow. It chews the cut, it has a split hoof. It's normal, it's clean, right? And so as you go through Leviticus, what it's describing again and again, these little one-sentence lines about uh, you shall not use two sets of weights, one to buy and one to sell. Why? That's clean. That's, that's normal. That's how it should be. You shouldn't sell with one weight and buy with another. You should honor the aged. You go through all of these uh, expectations about what is normal or what is clean, right? And, and so the covenant becomes this way of a commitment to clean. And, and so all of Leviticus can be seen as God in intending to form a people to understand what it means to be clean or normal, remembering that they've been in slavery for a few generations. They have forgotten what it's like to be free and make their own decisions. So God is laying out, here is what it looks like to be clean, to be normal. Here is how you should live day to day. And so if clean, the, the next step, the next term we look at is then unclean. And, and a, a pig is always unclean. You can take that pig, you can scrub it all day long, it will never be clean. Why? Because cl clean and unclean are about normal and the exception. If something is unclean, then it is the exception, right? And it, if livestock should be uh, chew the cud and have split hooves, pigs don't. And so they will always be unclean because they are an exception to how livestock should be. And so if you look through uh, all the things that are prohibited with this view of what's normal and what's the exception, it helps make sense of it, right? It says you should eat anything that swims. What, what, if, what swims, right? Fish. Fish usually have scales. So the, the fish that swim and have scales are clean. They're normal. Do catfish have scales? Nope. Unclean has nothing to do with dirt. They're the exception to what is normal. Shellfish, do shellfish swim and have scales? Nope. 
unclean. Scrub them all day long, doesn't matter, still unclean. Dead bodies are unclean. Why are dead bodies unclean? Because life is the norm and death is the exception. So dead bodies are always unclean. Never, they can't be clean. And so while pigs are always unclean and cows are always clean, there are objects that can move between clean and unclean, right? And so if you have a house, a regular house, it's clean, right? Normal house, just living in a house. What if you have a mold infestation, a mold problem in your house? Is that normal? Nope. Now it's unclean because that's the exception. There's a whole chapter in Leviticus about leprosy, and the word leprosy is used very broadly. If you have an infection in your skin, that's leprosy. If you have mold on your clothing, that's leprosy. If you have mold, that would probably be considered leprosy right there, right? That's not normal. So that's unclean. That would be considered leprosy to have that exposed, uh, messed up brick, right, like that. And so you, these things can move back and forth between clean and unclean. The way you take a, a piece of cloth, clothing that has mold on it, it's unclean. You clean it, you stitch it, repair it, and now it's clean again. We're going to repair the wall. It will be clean again. So things can go back and forth between clean and unclean. And this includes people as well. If you touch a dead body, you're unclean until you wash yourself. And, and I think... The most important way of showing that uh, it's about normal and exception, not clean and unclean as we think about it, is when it comes to sex. Yes, Leviticus acknowledged sex exists. And it says that when you have sex, wash up afterwards because during, during it, you're unclean. Well, let's think about that from this point of view of normal and exception. It is the exception that you're making love because how much of time do you spend in bed? Right? Compared to the rest of your life, it's not normal to spend all your life in bed with another person. Right? So just, it's not dirty, it's just not the norm. The, the old, first Old Testament commandment is go forth and make babies. Right? Go forth and multiply. So it's not that sex is wrong, it's that it's the exception. So wash yourself up afterwards and you're clean again. So we've covered clean and unclean and now holy. Holy is literally apart or different or, or complete. Leviticus does not assume that everything or everyone should be holy, but there are certain objects that are always holy. The tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the instruments of worship, and there are things uh, that can become holy, right? The, when you offer a goat and, and a portion of that goat, it, it, the meat is eaten by the priests, that meat is now holy, right? And there can be movement between the three. A priest who is holy, because he's a part in, in helping to serve and worship, if a priest touches that, that body, then the priest has become unclean, and then he needs to become clean and then holy again. So you can move between the three statuses, unclean, clean, and holy. Okay, so everyone on board here? Unclean, clean, holy? Does that make sense to everyone before we move on? Okay, now... How do you move between them? That's the next step of this sort of sacrificial system. But it's easy to go in one direction. If you are holy or clean and you want to become unclean, sin. Do something stupid, self-centered, greedy. Do something out of anger, sin. Right? That, that's, don't pay attention to the covenant. Don't love your neighbor. Forget about God. And you move towards becoming unclean. If you want to go in the other direction... That's where the, the challenge is, right? To go from unclean to clean usually involves some sort of ritual washing. To go from clean to holy usually involves some sort of blood or sacrifice. Uh, and we went and we looked at the, that the details of this matter last week. We're not going to get into the details th this week, but uh, we're going to look at just this mechanism. Because if you have to go and you make a sacrifice to become clean again, how does that sacrifice work? Right? And the temptation is, when we're talking about sacrificing a goat, is to have a very mechanical understanding of that. Like, if, if I have to lay my hand on the head of the goat before the goat is sacrificed, how long do I have to lay my hand on the head of the goat before it's effective? And I have to offer my best goat? Well, can I offer my almost best goat? Is that, is is that going to get me forgiven? That sort of mechanical understanding? And, and sort of look at these, to look at sacrifice as like cooking chicken, chicken, in Pyrex, in the oven, 350, how long do I need to cook it to, to, to make sure it's fully cooked, right? It, that's a mechanical way of looking at it, right? How good of a goat do I have to sacrifice to be forgiven? Th that's not what's happening here. That, that's, that mechanical way of viewing it doesn't 
understand what's happening. When we, you go forward to offer a goat, the priest helps you sacrifice it, and then God forgives. Right? So it's a relational thing that's happening here. And, and so to understand it, I want to ask you to pick a relationship. Pick a relationship with someone you know well and have known for a long time. Right? Get that person in your head, friend, family member, son, uh, daughter, parent, spouse, whoever. And there are, think of the thing you do to maintain that relationship. Right? What do you do together? Right? I make Olivia hot chocolate before we go to bed, after we put the kids down. I, I call John, a friend of mine, John Pinkston, a couple times a week. I mean, there are things we do with the people with whom we're in relationships. And, and then think about what you do when that relationship hits a snag. Right? When something goes sideways, when something goes wrong. Right? Let's say I do something wrong. I'd like to say if I do something wrong, but let's be honest, it's when I do something wrong and I offend Olivia. It's just a matter of time. I will probably go and buy her flowers. Right? Is there a mechanical scale? Right? Like if I forget to do the dishes, that's one rose. But if I forget to do the dishes and I forget to take the meat out of the freezer and, she, and the kids aren't dressed, is that like three roses? Is it like a mechanical thing? Right? And you know, I, I, get, I, I offend Olivia and I, I go get her seven roses and a baby's breath and a vase and now she has to forgive me because I got her seven roses. Right? No, that's not how it works. You give the roses and you go, hey, please, and, and then she chooses, or not, to forgive me based upon the relationship. Right? That's, the, that, that's how this, this works. This is the we're getting at here. The ritual is, is in which we get right with, you know, which, with each other is determined by the person with whom we're in a relationship. Right? I, I have a good friend, John Pinkston, and if I get sideways with him, if I get him seven roses and baby's breath and a nice vase, he's going to look at me like I've gone stupid. Because right? that's not the relationship we have. And, and so what we're reading in Leviticus is God laying out the relationship. In, in a sense, this is how God asks for roses. Right? This is how God is laying out what God would like of us to get right with God. Does that make sense? Right? It's relational, it's not mechanical. So holy, clean, and unclean, and it's a relational dynamic that's happening here. One last piece to put in place to kind of hold this all together. Why does a sacrifice cost so much? Right? How much is a goat worth? If you think about it, you have a herd of goats and you do wrong and you have to offer, you're not offering a shoulder, you're not offering a leg, you're offering a goat, right? That's a lot, right? Or if you have to offer an epha of flour, an epha of flour is 22 liters of flour. Ten, two liters, right? That's the volume you have. And that's not just flour you went to the store and bought. That's flour that you harvested yourself and you ground by hand, right? This is expensive flour. Why does it cost so much? Why are the sacrifices such, of such significance? I, I think there are two, it's getting at two things here. First, I think it is getting, it's God trying to shape a people to understand how damaging sin is. How often do you do something stupid and you have no clue how stupid it was until much later? Right? You do something and you think, oh, that'll be okay, and you, you're wrong. Completely wrong. Right? The, the sacrificial system is trying to help them understand up front, you do something stupid, it hurts, it causes damage, it is expensive to sin. It is going to do more harm than you can than realize, and if, to help you realize how much damage you're causing, bring me a goat. Uh, goat? Yep, entire goat. Right? This is, uh, I, th I was thinking about this, like, once I messed up, I know you're surprised, and I offended Olivia, I know, surprising. She was a senior in college, I was off at, at, at Duke, and for the life of me, we, I can't remember what I did, and Olivia can't either, and it's probably better that way, but I had messed up so badly that I called and I sent her roses for the first time ever. And did I send one rose? Nope. Did I send a dozen rose? Nope, nope, nope. I sent two dozen roses shipped in January. Right? It's also good I forgot how much that cost me. Right? That, that sense of, I have deeply messed up. I need to sacrifice something and, and get right, right now. That's what God's trying to instill in the people. This is not something you just take lightly. And so, second part of this is that Worship becomes shaped to be the place, not where you show up to receive, but where you show up to sacrifice. You show up to worship not because you're going to get given something. You show up because you are going to offer 
something. For the worship for the Jewish people was either showing up to give thanks and to sacrifice because everything was just wonderful to say thank you, or to sacrifice because something had gotten messed up so bad that they had to get right. You know that feeling? There are people in our lives that if we're sideways with them, our lives are simply wrong until we get right with them. All right, that's the sense that's trying to be inculcated here, formed into the people. That it is time. You've got to get, show up and either celebrate that it's good or you've got to sacrifice until it's right. And this leads to an interesting way of viewing worship that we see even it's in King David. When King David has to make an offering, it's in 2 Samuel, and you can think of this as uh, David, he needs to go get God some flowers, right? He needs to go get God some roses, and he's looking for the flower shop, right? He, he's looking for the place where he is going to sacrifice because he's got to get right with God. And, and the guy uh, who has the land that he needs uh, says to him, I will give it to you. I will give you the land, I will give you the cattle, I will give you the, the, the wood you need. And David's response, I will not offer to God what cost me nothing. Isn't that interesting, right? I will not offer to God what cost me nothing. If I need to get right with Olivia and I go and get a rose, that takes time and effort. If I need to go get right with Olivia and I go into the other room and grab a flower that Sophia picked last week out of a glass cup and bring it to her, you think that's going to fly? Right? I will not offer to God what cost me nothing. Right? Worship, there's a sacrifice there, and you can't give it unless it costs you something. I, th I think that gets at the, the truth of how worship is meant to be. Worship in their Jewish understanding is rooted not in receiving, but in offering. We don't come to worship to receive, we come to offer. I think that's what Paul describes in worships. It's in Ro worship, it's in Romans 12. He says, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Don't bring me a goat next week, please. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Don't bring me 22 liters of flour. Bring me a sacrificed life. Bring God a, sacri a sacrificial, uh, a renewed life, a life of following Jesus. That's the sacrifice that God desires. And so reading Leviticus, it shapes us to see worship as a place and a time to sacrifice of ourselves, either in thanksgiving for how good life is, or in repentance to re repair the relationships that desperately need to get made right. Amen. Good. We come to a time when we confess when we have fallen short of God's calling upon our lives. Please